FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today is June 25th, 2019. Don't forget, enter our Bitcoin contest. All entries must be in by July 14th. Guess the price on midnight, July 20th. Come closer than me. My prediction, 66.50. I'm already blown out of the water, but you never know. We still got close to a month to go. The grand prize, we've upped it to 40 pre-1965, 90% silver, 25 cent pieces, and five runner-ups will each receive one pre-1965 quarter. Hey, if we get a thousand entries, we will up the grand prize to 100 quarters, and each runner-up will get 10 pre-1965 quarters. Well, anyways, hey, got to give before you get. Uh, what is our reason for being here? Is personal greed really a means to happiness. Well, Danielle Park is with us now, juggling dynamite.com. And Danielle, you made an interesting point that in the upcoming Canadian election, I forgot you guys were having one, but I think it's in same year as us, 2020. Uh, the thing most concerning the Canadian population is ethics. Now that's like a new thing. Usually it's the economy, it's burgeoning debt levels in the U S it's Let's give everybody free college because it's so valuable that, you know, if it's free, everybody will be prosperous. But here, it's all tied in. It's all about ethics. It's all about values. It's all about uh, really what kind of world do you want to live in? But did that surprise you, that that uh, survey? No, it didn't. So 73% of Canadians polled said ethics will be the primary thing influencing their vote in the next federal election. And what occurred to me in that is that I think for uh, long periods of time, I won't say always, because I'm sure these things are cyclical, but for long periods of time, there was an assumption of a certain baseline ethical standard uh, of disclosure, of transparency, you know, certain um, things were just considered, you know, well, no one would do that. So that sort of thing, there was a certain business etiquette and political etiquette about things. And I think in the last 20 years, we've really degraded any assumption or presumption of a base standard. And we've really seen a um, free-for-all, unlike we'd seen, say, in several years before that. And so I think what's really jolted people in the last even five years is some of the incredible conflicts of interest, which just seem to be rampant and and like a mainstay of the entire corptocracy revolving door between business interests and politicians um, that have dominated the world. And so I think that's why now people are sort of saying, well, gee, if, if there's not a sort of a basic etiquette that we can presume candidates will follow, then we need to have to make it a priority now. So in other words, they used to think ethics was the foundation on which things were sitting. And now they realize that that foundation has been eroded and we have to really go back to trying to rebuild the foundation before we start worrying about anything even more advanced than that. Yeah. Well, interesting. Uh, it's just something so basic that you would think, uh, you know, it would just be a baseline, but, but politicians being politicians, they have a sliding scale of ethics uh, there's no black and white when you're a politician. Everything is gray, kind of like being a lawyer in a lot of ways. And you're always seeking to push the ethical limits. Do you think this is like blowback or reaction to the corruption that we've seen worldwide? And the other point I'd like to make, a separate point, is that when you're not in hock up to your eyeballs, when you're not drowning in debt, it's a lot easier to be ethical, isn't it? Well, I think there's a direct connection there. So for sure, we've had this massive consolidation in industry over the last two decades. We know for sure that we have, for example, half as many publicly listed companies in America, or we did have 
say in 2014, which is when this last study was done, versus 1997. And we know that now with all the consolidation, 94% of revenues go to the top four firms in any one sector. So what you automatically have is less competition. When you have less competition, you have more concentration of wealth in a few, and you have more uh, political power lobbying ability. This, these things have all gone part and parcel. And so really the hollowing out of the middle class and the working people and everybody else has gone on now for so long that you've got this very distended system where some people are grotesquely, you know, enriched with a huge amount of unhealthy influence over all policies and procedures. And then you have everybody else, as you say, suffering under massive amounts of debt. Um, And that makes them more vulnerable. It makes them less able to be whistleblowers. It lets them uh, be less able to change jobs or to start new operations or to follow a, you know, passion or sense of duty to one's community. Um, You have politicians who, you know, at different times, and I won't say always, but at different times have gone into things more to do with service. Um, Uh, Whether you're heading charities even today, charitable uh, goods, foundations, uh, people running pensions, these were all sort of considered callings or jobs of service uh, in, in, you know, let's say ancient times, let's say 50 Mm, years ago, um, where you went primarily out of a sense of doing great benefit, uh, not out of the sense of becoming a gazillionaire overnight sort of thing. And I think now what we've got is all these blurred lines. And I'm not against becoming, you know, financially uh, stable or, or it's not about that. It's about if you're taking unfair advantage and you're querying rules in your favor and you're breaking ethical principles and you're breaching trust. Um, like a, a prime example, Carrie, is the financial industry, of course, the one that I have to work in every day. Um, you know, you saw that disaster come out of the SEC a couple of weeks ago in the States where we were waiting for them to reendorse a fiduciary standard for brokers, which was already the standard for registered advisors like myself who have to, as a lawyer, you know, as we're lawyers, you have to put your client's best interest ahead of just sheer profit uh, expansion for yourself. And this is the way it's always been for registered advisors. And so they were trying to bring in, some people were promoting this idea that, you know, people that are giving advice and calling it financial advice, like it was before 1982, they really should be held to a fiduciary standard. However, what happened was, this is another example of this lobby power concentration in the financial sector. They not only deflected the uh, standard from um, themselves and and were not forced to take on fiduciary duty, but they actually watered it down for everybody. So now this new best interest standard is supposedly applicable to uh who those of us who think of our who act as fiduciaries who've always been required to act as a fiduciary are now held to this somehow weird standard that's not really fiduciary and it's sort of to try and bring everyone down to the sales um you know the sales focus as the driving mandate and so they've really confused the hell out of it you know made it a mess now the consumer really has no way of knowing who they're dealing with in terms of who has what interests at stake um, and that's just one area that's happened in all the major sector areas. Hey, there was a story, you know, you make me think about ethics and it was an arthritis drug, I believe that apparently had a beneficial effect for Alzheimer patients. And it was at the end of its patent. I don't remember the company, so I don't want to say a company's name and be wrong about it because that mm-hmm. would not be a good thing. But I remember reading this story and it was in multiple outlets and I kept uh, going back and forth to try to vet the story and deconstruct it. But the upshot was that uh, it wasn't through a clinical trial. It was through, uh, through actually medical claims that they saw that people who were taking this drug for one thing had about three quarters or two thirds less incidence of Alzheimer's. And, you know, no research was ever done into it. No check was ever made. The drug company said, well, you know, this isn't proof because it's just medical claims. It's not uh, as a result of double blind studies, but maybe the fact that it had a year left to run on patent uh, had something to do with it. But it was like, how could you like, 
Could you really suppress a drug or not immediately follow it up, even if you weren't going to be able to profit from it? How could you like do that? Is that uh, really aspiring to be your best self and and being the best your company can be? FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Financial Survival Network is brought to you today by Orin Resources, a junior exploration company with the appetite of a major. It's hot on the trail of the next globally significant discovery, creating enormous potential upside for you, the shareholder. Orin is one of the most aggressive exploration companies pursuing high-grade, scalable gold and copper deposits and has a premier seven-project portfolio including its two flagships, Committee Bay in the Arctic and Sombrero in Peru. Oren's unparalleled technical team and highly experienced management has a history of success in advancing and monetizing exploration assets. No wonder Oren's been called one of the best in the junior exploration sector. Oren trades on the TSX and the NYSE under AUG. To learn more, go to orenresources.com. That's A-U-R-Y-N resources.com. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. So this is where this whole hiding behind the corporate veil breaks down, right? Because if you were an individual and you were, you know, you had the, uh, you weren't able to make profit on that drug if you were to release it, but you may still feel like obliged on an individual basis or maybe on an ethical sense of, well, it, you know, it's not going to cost me to release it to the public, this information, if someone else wants to develop it or research it or sell it, so be it. But when people are acting within a corporate structure, they ultimately, first of all, as we've talked before, there's that prima facie uh, shareholder profits as the primary motivation and sole purpose, that Milton Friedman nonsense that evolved from the 1970s and really has become a distorted mess. Um, That is, if there's no other obligation or responsibility or duty or ethical calling other than just maximizing shareholder return. So that's where the corporation really breaks down in this, because if it's not about maximizing corporate returns, then people will throw out any other duty or obligation in the sense of saying, well, that's not our business. So this is why I think we need a lot more. um, um, First of all, you know, again, it goes back to the consolidation that's happened. And these things are pendulums. They swing back and forth. We've just happened to be at the end of 20 years of intense Mm -hmm. consolidation. And and that's borne out on every, like I said, whether you're looking at um, market participants in, in public markets, whether you're looking at share of revenue, whether you're looking at corporate profits, whether you're looking at the growth of uh, the labor share of, of income, all these things just scream that we've been through this very extended cycle in the one direction. And now we need to swing back the other way. And we may indeed get to a time uh, several years from now where it's too far, you know, the other way um, um, and consolidation will start to make sense again. But here we are right now today at a crisis point. And, and we aren't going to be able to get on to the sustainable recovery, the really cool, you know, reinvention for the future um, until we make some leveling in this system until, you know, so at a state level, for example, many states are starting to back into this fiduciary duty. But it's just, again, on this mm-hmm. issue of ethics, states on a, on a that level are starting to bring in fiduciary standards and say, no, if you're going to give advice in this locale, you have to actually hold yourself to a standard like a lawyer or a doctor. We're not going to let you give out, you know, sales pitches and and enrich yourself at the expense Mm -hmm. of the, of the people who are trusting you for that information, but it's rampant and it's everywhere. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's screaming for redress. Now, Many people back to, you know, I said the working topic of my new book is give to get. I mean, back to this whole point that, you know, many people will say, well, you can't regulate more because there'll be this side effect or that side effect. You'll have unintended consequences. But the point is that there's always unintended consequences, but there's also reasons to act. And you have Mm -hmm. to give in the sense of give up some of your privilege, some of your um, one sidedness in this current system in order to have greater prosperity, greater, uh, you know, um, momentum and sustainability in this in the economy and upward mobility to get back to rebuilding the middle class, all that stuff. So you definitely have to give in order to get. Um, and we've given a lot in terms of ethics and 
and income sharing and, you know, investing in things that matter in order to get this grotesquely skewed system that we have today. So now that grotesquely skewed system has to also give in order to get broader sharing of resources and advantage going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I found the article so I can say the company It was Pfizer and it was a rheumatoid, <coughs> excuse me, rheumatoid arthritis therapy called Enbril. And it appeared to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's by two thirds, 64%. So you can, and, but it would have cost $80 million and there was no potential for profit. It was like coming up, testing vitamin C against cancer. And, you know, that just brought home that uh, something is really wrong with the way we do business in the world, that business was originally a means of organizing units of society to produce more and increase the benefit of society as a whole. Yeah. And we're so far from that now. I mean, it was just companies created to, to really come up with more efficient ways to generate wealth and, you know, and jobs and taxes and, the, yeah. and reinvestment in the local economy right. and cash flow for people to put yeah. back into their community. All that, all that. Well, no more. So it's just to benefit but a few. Again, wealthy. you can see how it started out. You, you know, I have nothing is ever really inc incomprehensible. Like you can see the origins of the thing, and I've studied the origins of corporations and how it all started. And you understand mm -hmm. the ebb and flow. You understand how it seems like such a good idea in the beginning, but then you get this constant flow of you know uh, vertical integration where everyone gets sucked mm -hmm. up into the mothership and we've seen this for example oh, yeah. with the tech sector in the last decade profoundly you know mm -hmm. all these um, little startup ideas were were bought up by all the big competitors conglomerates and now you've got this you know world where your information is shared amongst you know every possible conceivable thing in the world without you even realizing they're connected um, and that's just one example but that's another reason why you know they're too big to govern um, and they are geo they're uh, international so they are able to escape tax in a pretty significant way all over the earth and they're able to you know enrich uh, some um, pockets or, or hire some pockets of labor, but never reinvestment in the community anymore in which, you know, the customers are coming from. So that's why you've got this very distorted situation right now. And so it's, it's like, it's, you know, we have to go back. So another thing, I don't know if you noticed this today, but speaking of extreme themes, we have the um, 100 year Austrian bond. So the Austrians uh, listed a bond in, in um, 2017 that was yielding 2.17%. And it was a 100-year bond due in wow. two, 2117. And at that point, you think, geez, well, who would sign up for 2.1% for 100 years? Well, the answer is because pensions and insurance companies, again, speaking of the greater good, fundamental institutions that underline uh, you know, people's ability to retire, people's ability to get money if their house burns down, if their loved one dies. You know, mm -hmm. insurance is a pretty cool, pensions and insurance have been a pretty fundamental underpinning to upward yeah. mobility in the world for the last, you know, couple of hundred years. It's pretty critical. And we've got these institutions because we've had this two decades of central banks mm -hmm. gone crazy who are not accountable to any elected uh body who are not, you know, held to any uh, standard of accountability. And they've been running the show with all these more bizarre policies and ego driven nonsense. And what's happened is they've literally gutted these fundamental pinnings under underneath the social structure. So they force things like um, free money, you know, into the system, all this liquidity, they're subsidizing speculation at the, at the cost of um, significant investment in things that matter at the cost of strength and stability. And so Austria had this bond issue and now they've got the idea, hey, yields have fallen because central banks have started cutting rates again, as you know, Carrie, in the yeah. world, Australia yeah, and Russia and places like that. And you've got the U.S. Fed now talking about, uh, you know, their capitulation in the not too distant future. Um, and so all of a sudden, yield curves have all tanked all over the world. You've got inversions. I think 70 percent of the world's yield curves are inverted, classic recession style stuff. And so as that's happened, this 
as an example, this 100-year bond has risen 60% in value. And in the process, if you're going to buy it now, your yield for the next 100 years would be 1.2%. <laughs> so what, what seemed madness. crazy at 2.1 yeah. is now almost half that. And the Austri- Austrian government is saying, hey, why don't we reopen that issue? Yeah, we'll go buy them it back. To people. Yeah. Sell it to people, uh, and um, we and you know we'll get sixty percent more than we issued in principal face, and uh, they'll earn one point two percent for the next hundred years. Now that might sound great from a government's perspective that wants to you know keep mm-hmm. riding out fiscal deficits, but for institutions that are required to match liabilities to assets. Clearly, this is a massive problem. Again, this goes back to you're gutting the middle class. You're gutting the bulk of the world's population, their strength and stability for short term financialization preoccupation, you know, buying back shares, doing everything to keep liquidity uh, excessive and and going into speculative pursuits in the front Mm -hmm. end and undermining all of our ability for resilience going forward. And so this is what's Mm -hmm. come back to haunt us today. And I believe that we're heading into a now a quite a significant contraction in the world economy and the world asset markets because it's been already the longest extension ever. And because there's so many policy mistakes that have been made right from over tightening in the last year to Mr. Trump's missteps all over the place to the corptocracy calling the shots and running the show in places like Canada too, and all Mm -hmm. over. And so now we've got so many policy missteps that we've fabricated this period of severe downturn. And I think it's going to be a shock to people that are not expecting it. Oh, and it's coming. There's no question about that. Well, it just uh, shows the more things change, the more they stay the same. You know, this is nothing new here. It's just uh, it's gone to such extremes. Anyway, we got to run now, but make sure you check out Danielle's site and her insightful commentaries on jugglingdynamite.com. Check out us, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Email me, kl at Kerry Lutz. Enter the, enter the uh, contest. Make sure Bitcoin is in your subject line. Uh, it was Last I looked, it was $11,000. I haven't looked again lately, but uh, could well be going up. Although gold was up today. It's down now. Who the heck knows? Anyway, Danielle, always a pleasure. We will talk to you again real soon. Thanks, Kerry. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.